Hello, and welcome to Differential Discussions. I'm Melissa. Dave. And today, we're back with our guest series where we are going to talk to LaShanta Bryce about DCLS, being a DCLS, going through a DCLS program, all the good stuff. So LaShanta, welcome. Can you just tell us your story? Hi everyone, as I've been introduced, my name is LaShanta Bryce, but some of you that are listening might not know that name. Actually, my last name before I started as a practitioner, DCLS, was Smart. So my maiden name is actually LaShanta Smart. Um, so lots of people know me as Sean and several other names, but um, I have a an interesting story, at least I think it's interesting. Um, I started my career um, as a military brat. So I did not stay in one place for a very long period of time. In fact, I did not get the, the good end of moving for the military. Um, most of the time we moved uh, during, during uh, times when I needed to actually have a stable set of friends. So like think about uh, middle school and high school. Nope, you're moving. Um, so ultimately my uh, journey ended in Virginia. So I ended up at Virginia Commonwealth University um, and I started there in 2004. Um, and I really wasn't uh, a CLS student. I was actually pre-med. And um, as I progressed through pre-med, I, I figured out with my personality that maybe pre-med and me did not mix. Um, so I decided to go to my uh, counselor and my counselor actually uh, went through a list of health professions because I still wanted to do something in health care, but I didn't want to be an MD anymore. Um, Funny story, uh, those that have met me in person know that I'm actually an introvert. And I actually told my parents when I was like four that I wanted to be a cheerleader. That didn't work out either. So <laughs> um, going back to college, um, I was perked when I heard the word clinical laboratory science because I had a very strong science background, even starting in high school. Um, so I uh, threw all my eggs in one basket. I was already a junior by the time I reached my sophomore year. Uh, because I took lots of dual enrollment and AP classes in high school. And then um, I was admitted into VCU's um, clinical laboratory science program. And I started from going from 12 hours to a good wholesome 18 and a half. That was a giant slap in the face for me. <laughs> um, so I had to give up a lot of things. Um, I was very active in a lot of um, college campus organizations and I had to give up uh, about 90% of those um, to just get my, my feet into the CLS uh, department. Um, at that time, so this is in 2007, I started working as a non-certified MLT um, in their core laboratory, um, only working on the coagulation bench and the urinalysis bench. And a lot of times when people hear this, they're like, that's, that's odd. Why would you want to do that? I was like, well, guys, at the time when I went to college, like minimum wage was $7.50. And that is, uh, this is when gas was like $5, guys. So $7 an hour is not going to get you very far in your car. <laughs> so uh, with that, I worked weekend night shift. So I got weekend differential and night shift differential. So I was making like, you know, pretty good money. Um, and this began my great love of hematology. So then I really started to shift over to like, I like hematology and I'm not really anything else. Uh, so I actually got to go through my rotations at the Veterans Affairs uh, Hospital in Richmond. And then it came time for me to graduate. And at this time, the clinical laboratory uh, was doing great with personnel. This was not the era where there were lots and lots of slots open. My class graduated uh, a little bit under 30 people. And um, there were not, guess what, guys? There were not 30 slots open uh, in the Richmond area. Richmond is a metropolitan area, but it's not you know, Los Angeles. <laughs> Um, so I elected to use some of my military uh, brat roots, and I went back home to Texas. And for those of you that are listening, like you don't have a Texas accent, that's because I didn't stay there long enough to pick up one. Um, so I went back and I actually found my first job uh, on Craigslist as a uh, military contractor um, that would work in their trauma one center for the Air Force and their hematology department. So when I was picked up, as a hematology uh, lab scientist, 
uh, my supervisor at that time only really had to train me in differentials. I had been trained on all instrumentation to include their LAS because the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense shared the same LAS EHR system. Um, so there I slotted myself into hematology and then that's pretty much where we're gonna stay this entire story, guys. I stayed in hematology and, the, and about nine months in, I was asked um, to potentially apply for civil service, civil service position. So that means that I'm gonna enter in back into the federal system. Fun fact, I actually worked for the federal system at the age of 16 at Quantico um, under the DECA system, which is the uh, group that runs their uh, grocery store, uh, which is called a commissary. Um, so I had about a year of experience um, working as a federal employee um, from the age of 16 to 17. Um, and now I'm going to potentially go back in. So I was hired back in to the federal system. And then I started uh, pretty much running with hematology. Um, I began teaching uh, military phase two students um, at the bench level. Um, their didactic was uh, taught by a separate group. And then, uh, so we've heard my story that I didn't uh, in particular like moving a lot. Um, at year four, the uh, government decided to do some changing. So this resulted in an act called the Base Realignment and Closure Act. In San Antonio, which is where I landed at, um, there were several bases that were open. Due to the Base Realignment and Closure Act, that meant that they were gonna start closing some of the bases. And this also meant sweeping changes for healthcare for the military. This resulted in me actually being transferred to the US Army Trauma One Center. So uh, of note, I had just bought a house uh, that was approximately 10 minutes away from the hospital. And now I went from 10 minutes to a 45 minute commute. <laughs> um, so in February of 2012, in the middle of one of my cycles uh, for teaching for the Air Force, I was transferred to the United States Army's hospital known as Brook Army Medical Center, which is the Department of Defense's only trauma one center um, after the Base Realignment and Closure Act. So once I got there, I was expected to teach um, immediately. So I went from teaching Air Force students only over to teaching Army and Navy students. And it was quite different. So if any of my students are listening, you very much know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I went from teaching uh, mostly bench um, procedures to teaching both didactic and bench. Um, I was sent over in an emergent state. Um, one of my coworkers was going out on emergency leave, which is why I had to leave in the middle of a cycle. Um, so I did that for a long period of time. About 50% of my duties were uh, assigned to teaching and 50% were assigned to uh, working in the laboratory. Um, during this, I was also promoted. Um, and then I was expected to be a lead right from jump. And I had no lead experience, guys, zero. Um, I had been teaching and working the bench. I didn't know how to write an SOP. Uh, I didn't know how to do quality control review. I didn't know how to do really anything except like run instrumentation and read differentials. <laughs> um, so it was a, a quick learning curve, but I was up to the task. Um, and during this time, I decided uh, maybe I should get an advanced degree. So I went back to school again. Um, so I took uh, a little bit of a tour getting this one done because I was working full time this time and not just weekend nights. Um, and I enrolled at University of Southern Mississippi um, into their medical laboratory science master's degree program because I really thought I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and about four years in, so there's just gonna be this pattern of four guys. Uh, four years in, um, I was going to get my teaching duties decreased um, in favor of hiring a full-time instructor. So I would remain the backup instructor and then I would shift from about 50-50 to like 90-10. So 90% in the laboratory and 10% teaching duties. Um, so I graduated in 2014 with a master's degree and then I thought, well, you know, I made a promise to be a doctor, but maybe not a physician. Um, so at that point, I still did not want to go to med school at all, um, but I still wanted to add the, the title doctorate um, in my educational journey. So I entered into an EDD program, um, and it was in uh, nursing pediology. 
So I am a lab scientist, a true lover of hematology. My whole entire career is going to be spent in hematology. And when I got to that program, I was very unhappy. And by chance, um, I happened to be perusing ASCLS's um, discussion boards, and I saw that UTMB was going to open their uh, doctorate in clinical laboratory science program. And so much of what I did before, I put all my eggs in one basket. <laughs> this is unsafe, don't do this in general, guys. <laughs> but, but I put my, all my eggs in one basket and I joined um, in the application pool for the second class that would be admitted and the only spring class that would be ever admitted to the UTMB DCLS program. So in January of 2017, I entered into that class and began my journey as a DCLS while working full time at Burke Army Medical Center. And just to sprinkle some more drama into this, um, I also decided to get married <laughs> uh, in the middle of matriculating as a DCLS student. Um, so I got married uh, about uh, four years in uh, to my educational journey um, and then changed my name over to Smart Dash Bryce. And then finally people just accepted to just drop off the smart and then convert to Bryce. Um, so I uh, graduated in December of 2021, um, and then I uh, joined Diagnostic Estado. But we'll stop here and let's let's ask some questions about kind of how we got from Brook Army Medical Center as a hematology scientist over to IVD um, in coagulation. What? So I think Aaron. one one question that we could go with first is what's the difference? Because you have your bachelor's in MLS, your master's in MLS, and then the DCLS. So what's the difference in the rigor between the bachelor's level, the master's level, and the doctorate level? So at the bachelor's degree level, you're just forming your foundation. Um, and the, the slap in the face I got with the eight and a half credits would not have necessarily happened to traditional students that were taking like probably 15 credits. I had dropped down to 12, which was the minimum to keep me full time because I kind of just ran out of classes that were applicable to the degree. So I just dropped. It was taking like kind of what I would call frou fruit classes, like introduction to Microsoft Word uh, was a credit classroom. Um, so when I went to the bachelor's degree, I was more forming all of my scientific knowledge, right? I took all of my uh, physical sciences and melded those with all of my biological sciences into what would then become translational science for my clinical laboratory science degree at the bachelor's degree level. When I got to the master's degree, then it was a lot lower of a credit hour, but it was a lot of writing an excessive around, amount of writing. So if my professors from USM are <laughs> listening, it's a lot of writing, um, but it's a lot of writing to try to prepare you to be able to defend your points. Um, when I say defend your points, it means using scientific evidence to actually establish um, either your defense in selecting what you're writing in your SOP versus potentially implementing new clinical guidelines into the laboratory. From there, the DCLS is less writing, significantly less writing <laughs> than the master's degree program. However, there's a big change that you're going to experience with the DCLS, and that is going to be you're going to have to recall all information from all disciplines. So if anybody ever sees my alphabet soup of a title, you'll see SH at the end for specialist in hematology. That does not mean as a DCLS um, practitioner, I just answer hematology questions only. Um, it, do, it did require me to recall a lot of knowledge that I had kind of uh, filed away. Um, and with that, I had to be a steward of my own knowledge, uh, meaning that I had to go seek out others that were experts in things like clinical chemistry, microbiology, and transfusion medicine. And fortunately for me, as a lead in the section, I was able to cross paths with the transfusion director, with the director of microbiology, and across the way from me in the core laboratory with several cl clinical chemists to help build my foundation back into what we would consider to be a clinical laboratory science house and not a hematology only house. Um, so being able to see the bigger picture um, for your testing, right? Oftentimes in the laboratory, we look at something like a CBC. 
and we interpret just the CVC. But guess what, guys? When you look at the CVC's functionality and things like DIC, now I need to look at the CVC plus my coag panel plus chemistries. Now I have to look at a liver function panel and potentially a haptoglobin. And then I have to look across the way at how that impacts how transfusion is going to actually order products to maintain the patient during the DIC crisis. So once you get to the DCLS, you start looking at what role your test plays in the greater disease state, as opposed to just interpreting the test for what the test is. Yeah, that's fascinating. Because like for, for you know, I, I'll speak for Melissa and she can just step on me if I'm wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> when we did our undergraduate, it felt a lot like, like a boot camp. I mean, it was an intense four years, um, a lot of information, a lot of weaving all of this together and then maybe on the grad side of things so we did a kind of um different paths in terms of our masters um but the master's degrees programs that we did were pretty straightforward um our bachelors kicked our butts is what i'm saying <laughs> and the masters seemed to be more like you know um so I was always curious, like with the DCLS, did, you know, does your path kind of take this like <laughs> this jump in difficulty? It can, right? So yeah. in if you look at the three programs that are in existence right now, their preference leans towards a more holistic medical laboratory scientist, someone that has various experience across all disciplines. That was actually not me, right? I came straight out from VCU, went into hematology, and then stayed in hematology. Despite some efforts to actually cross-train out, um, at some point, I was not allowed to cross-train out <laughs> um, because I had become very proficient in hematology, and it would be seen as a as taboo for me to actually cross-train. Um, so where I felt like I was climbing uphill uh, would be where I would have to start then applying things like in clinical chemistry. Now, instead of me looking at something simple like a Chem 7, now I have to apply it in various disease states, which I had not been doing before. This was easy for me to do with things in coagulation or having to do with anemia. I could easily do that for hematology, but I was expected to be able to do that in micro, in clinical chemistry. I was expected to be able to work up a difficult transfusion case with minimal assistance. These are where I kind of felt the the big uphill climb. Yeah, yeah, I agree sympathize. Melissa and I, our background is heavy hematology. We worked in a metropolitan hospital where we worked in the hematology lab. What we did. So you're amongst uh, your own. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, of course, there was moments where you're thinking about what chemistry, but you know, um, at a higher level. Yeah, you just don't you don't get it right. And, um, that's funny. So it prefer it's preferential towards a generalist, it seems, right? It would it would benefit you. So oftentimes people will ask like, well, what would you have done different? I was like, well, maybe I I could have started off as maybe a generalist, um, and that would have not you know had the tears that we cried in biochem, uh, because now we're trying to recall beyond just learning basic biochemistry and now having to apply it to like real patient scenarios. Um, fortunately, like I said, making friends with directors was really helpful because then when I had residents um, or when they had residents, I could converse with them and say like, hey, I have a patient here in residency where I'm at and I need some, some further interpretation. This is not my strong suit. Uh, what resources can I help? can I look at to help me along the way? I would never be a, a person that would ask like, hey, can you give me the answer? Because that doesn't help me in the end. And it certainly doesn't help the patient um, because then I, I'm not really helping the patient. I'm having someone else be a surrogate to help. So it was again, incumbent upon me to recognize where I had faults. And I had done this way earlier as a bachelor's degree student. Um, when I came back to speak at the university as an alumni, the current CLS students would ask like, well, how do you study for the registry? I'm like, well, I think at some point, like really when you get to like technically the last year, you should probably know at that point, whether you are in a journalist mindset where you know a little bit about everything, or if you've leaned too heavy into one discipline. 
if you are in group B, where you've leaned too heavy into one discipline, it's a, it's incumbent upon you to then rearrange your study schedule to actually accommodate for those weaknesses, right? So when I got ready for the registry, I'm not studying hematology, guys. Um, we're going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting for like clinical chemistry and micro because those were, you know, areas where I was not as strong. And a lot of people are like, you say not as strong, but you, you have like a solid B. I was like, yeah, guys, but a solid B in a class does not necessarily mean that you're able to recall enough information to pass your registry. So it, it's all about knowing yourself and learning yourself before you get to the point where you then have to demonstrate your knowledge. Yeah, it's kind of like minimizing weaknesses, right? Like just yeah. trying those to find, yeah. You know, it's wide words, students pay attention. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So when you start a DCLS program, you were saying that it was kind of expected that you had all of the knowledge already. So when you come in, you're expected to already have that like hematology, chemistry knowledge. So what are you learning? What sort of classes are you taking in a DCLS program if you're not relearning theory? So now you have to do application of theory. So that's why it's incumbent upon you to have the journalist knowledge and for me, it's much easier when I can look at a differential and say like, okay, this, this is probably, we're gonna have to reflect some things to molecular and potentially flow. That easily comes to me. Whereas someone that is an SBB is like, that does not come easy to me. What comes really easy to me is I can look at this anagram and then I can cross off very easy and I'm like, this looks like a Sudoku pu puzzle to me. Like I, so this is where there's kind of an exchange between the students where they have to kind of lean on each other. So the SBBs will help the non SBBs in those situations, and the SHs, the SCs, and the SMs will then step up to help in their respective disciplines. So at that point, when you are asking, like, you know, how do I interpret a sodium? The baseline is that you already know where the sodium lies that is already in a CMP or that's in the Chem 7, that they don't have to teach you the methodology of the sodium, that you already know that there are going to be some preamble interferences. They're not there to teach you that part. Um, when you take your clinical chemistry course, you're going to be applying this into individual disease states and then being able to link them um, is very important because when you get to your residencies or your rotations, um, you're not going to have your professor there with you. And chances are, you're probably not going to have your classmate there either. Um, so when you're sent into residency, um, you are expected to be able to help the rounding team on your own. So if you don't have that foundational knowledge, it behooves the DCLS student to either seek out mentors or folks that can help them with that foundational knowledge um, and especially understand it while they're matriculating through their application uh, application classes. You brought up something really interesting for me. So you talked about the SBBs and the SHs. And so would you say in the, um, if, if you don't mind me asking, how many people were in your uh, cohort of the DCLS? So the cohort for us was it was the weird class. So our class um, was named the Gemini right. class because we were a merge of the very first group that was admitted plus our class that was admitted in the spring. So in just the spring class, originally there were, I think, 14 people that were admitted. However, through uh, as they progressed through the didactic part where they had to start doing a lot of application, we did have some attrition. Um, so in the end, we really ended up with probably 10 people that continued through um, to get to the first residency. Um, when I got to the first residency, um, the first residency for me was what I would consider to be like grand rounds pathology, where you're not going to the floors, right? So we, we've given you all this didactic information, but we're not ready to send you to the floor yet. Um, which is good because we want to make sure that you have a really strong foundation. So we're going to keep you in the pathology suite, but you're going to still go through each of the disciplines. Um, in there, unfortunately, my class, uh, my split of the cohort ended up in team A and team B. I was on team B and team B had four SBBs on them. Well, that's not great for me. because 
Uh, this now means that, you know, oftentimes I made this mistake in high school, right? Um, when you're learning to drive, the instructor would ask, hey, who's never driven a stick? And I just popped my hand up. I was like, dumb. I That was a dumb mistake. Because as soon as you do that, you're instructing like, you're going to be the first person that drives a stick. Um, so in this case, when our instructors found out that there were a heavy amount of SVBs, all of the blood bank questions went to the non-SVBs because it was probably a, a thing that was a good thing for us non-SVBs to not rely on the SVBs to answer transfusion questions because in reality, when we go to the floor, our classmates not gonna be next to us. Um, so could they have split it up a little bit better? I think so, but I think it was just probably random draw uh, where they just put everybody's name in a bag and I just happened to be in the group with all the SVBs. <laughs> It sounds nice to be able to have sort of that collaborative learning environment with yeah. other specialties. Like that's that's really nice. Um, Melissa has the pleasure pleasure being an SH, married to an SBB. <laughs> that's um, fun. <laughs> sorry, she probably felt your pain a little. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of neat the way that that works out. And it is interesting as a teacher myself to think about how intelligently we could structure groups mm. together to be more diverse in their uh, knowledge and background uh, there. That's an interesting thing to think about. Um, well, in question about the students, because you referred to them as like the SBBs, the SCs, and the SMs, were they all specialty certified? Is that, <laughs> no, they weren't, okay. No, so there are the the minimum requirement to enter into the DCLS programs is to be a medical laboratory scientist. Um, so you do have to have the journalist uh, registry completed. Um, now, in my specific cohort, there just happened to be more specialists in there. Um, originally, actually, I had just I was one of the newer specialists because I was. Some people say like academically lazy. I was probably just tired. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I would have not taken the uh, SH exam until the 10 year mark of my career. So I had qualified way earlier, um, but um, the only, probably the only reason why I took it was at the time my hospital was offering to pay, uh, reimburse us for a specialty exam. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. I mean, this sounds like a good idea. I don't have to, I have to pay for it up front, but then I'm going to get reimbursed. So that's probably really the only reason why I did it. The second reason, which is probably the, the more genuine reason was because I had a coworker um, that I was pushing to get a, uh, a registry exam taken because um, the military has a special rule um, or they had a special rule where they would allow those that were trained in uniform to retain their training skills without the registry exam. Mm -hmm. Um, sometime later, that rule changed under CLIA, um, and those that were not uh, degreed with a registry were then forced to only do moderate complexity. As we know in hematology, not all tests in hematology are moderate complexity, um, so I was trying to encourage one of my coworkers to pass the H exam because she was a core lab uh, trained military person, and I was like, if you've been in core for like 20 years, you should be able to pass either the H or the C um, because you've done all of the work. Um, at the time in the 1970s, 1980s, the military was not a big proponent of having them pass a registry because it was not required, right? Um, a soldier's first job is not necessarily working in the hospital, um, but uh, nowadays we do try to think of our military students and try to get them to pass a registry for their life post uniform. So that was the the probably better reason why I did it. So you had a journey with a colleague sort of, right? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. So she did, she did pass the H um, and now she is actually a, a supervisor of a small clinic. So she's now gotten to apply some of that knowledge and she was, you know, kind of surprised. She's like, I, I feel like it wasn't that bad. I was like, yeah, if you have 20 years of experience, it really shouldn't be that bad. That's more years of experience than I have. That's double. <laughs> it's scary though, right? I mean, um, so in my experience, I, I was like a pretty good heme tech and for, you know, six or seven years and then it decided to do the SH. 
And when I started studying for the SH, I kind of got humbled a little bit by how much of the theory I may have been missing or didn't have maybe as fine a grasp as I might have uh, thought. Um, so it can be a little scary, definitely, when like you're, yeah. you know, clicking away in your diff counter and looking at waveforms and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like true or false. It, well, not true or false, but, you know, multiple choice que theory question. Um, those It can be intimidating. So I feel our pain a little bit there. Yes. So you, you, in the DCLS program, you take classes like ClinCam, but it's all application. Outside of the, like the general disciplines of med lab that we think of, like chem and micro and heme, mm -hmm. what other sorts of classes would you be taking in a DCLS program? So one of them is global health. Um, so you'll talk about the role of a laboratory director or laboratory consultant in global health diseases. You'll also take a class called diagnostic algorithms. This kind of focuses on multiple disciplines um, and looking at scientific recommendations, right? So one of the things that uh, was actually kind of shocking, but, you know, vision's always good looking backwards, um, was that I, um, I really just took the word of people when they made suggestions on hematology tests. I was like, okay, I'm just not going to think about it. Um, whatever my supervisor says, that's what we're doing. But then at some point, probably around year four or five, I was like, wait, where are these recommendations coming from? Um, and then I started looking at I'm like, oh, there's a lot of these. And why are we following all of these? Are we just making these up or, as we're going? Uh, so in diagnostic algorithms, you start looking at key uh, scientific societies and specifically for hematology, we started looking at things like ISTH um, for the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, or ISLH for uh, the International Society on Laboratory Hematology, and their recommendations, um, and then developing algorithms from there. And then, you know, you get challenged, right? Because as a medical laboratory scientist and as a scientist in general, we uh, fall in love with algorithms. But then as a DCLS, you kind of get a, a quick reality check on why those algorithms might not work in practice. <laughs> um, because the, the disconnect that happens in the clinical pathology grand rounds uh, residency is that you're looking at medical records. You're not looking at the patient and you're not looking at the patient's journey. So you're making decisions kind of in a closed vacuum, right? So you can make a suggestion to, hey, you know, in this, I saw that our patient has sepsis and these are the sepsis guidelines. Now that looks very different when you have to go to, let's say nephrology and you're getting consulted for an ER patient and you go down to the ER and then you see what is in the ER and then you can kind of see why we didn't make all of the recommendations that were from the sepsis guideline national committee. So it becomes very different from you making suggestions without being there to, okay, how do we do best case scenario with the guidelines for the patient, given what is going on with the patient in real time? Um, you'll also take uh, some courses for your doctoral defense. So as part of the second class that was admitted ever, um, there were some changes that were made um, during the matriculation of the first, second, third, and fourth classes. Um, the first class, um, which was not my class, they actually had to take pharmacology and pathophysiology together. I'm like, that is a terrible idea. Um, so in, in theory, it looks good, right? Those two are very closely linked. But in reality, that's a bad idea for like most students to try to cram into one class for one oh, semester. Yeah. The material was just significant, right? For both. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so by and pharmacology of, being something we're not particularly. Yeah. So yeah. You do need some pharmacology because you're going to be going to uh, your second rotation is uh, internal medicine, which is like pretty much, you know, internally managing medication. Um, so you do need pharmacology, but you needed to, it to be a separate class. Um, so by the time my class got to the part where you would take that, I'm like, hey guys, I'm not doing that. I think we should split it. We should really campaign to split the class. 
So um, by the time we got there, it was split into one class for pathophysiology, one class for pharmacology, which was very beneficial for me because as a master's degree student, I had already taken pathophysiology. Um, so I just got to take pharmacology. Um, so that was a, a good thing that they were able to shift their program according to the, pa the not patients, the students. Needs. Sometimes they're patients, maybe. Um, the <laughs> other thing big change was molecular diagnostics. So we know that in the laboratory uh, and in the educational sector, we have a pretty big diverse group of generations that are present in the clinical laboratory. And depending on where you were in the evolution of the clinical laboratory, that kind of determined where your knowledge of molecular diagnostics laid at. So when I went through Rotation for molecular diagnostics for me was literally being in the prep room only. So I didn't really learn any theory on molecular diagnostics. Now, fast forward about 10 years, now I have to be able to interpret methodologies for molecular diagnostics. And now my class is now called advanced molecular diagnostics. I'm like, I don't, I feel like we're not going to pass that. To be honest, like molecular diagnostics was not even a, a place where a graduate could even dream about working at without at least five to eight years of experience. Um, so I think I need a, a gentler version of molecular diagnostics. And uh, lo and behold, once we said that, um, several of us said that and the uh, split was made. Advanced molecular diagnostics was still an option because we had SMs that were uh, in the group. So they were fine with taking advance. And the uh, other people that were a little deficient, like myself, we elected to take introduction to molecular diagnostics with the master's degree students. Um, and this would teach us like basic things like setting up a gel, like really like what you would consider to be more of a graduate course and not a doctoral graduate course. And I think that was permissible for us because most of the things that we're going to be doing are more towards the big four disciplines and not leaned towards molecular. That does not mean that we don't have to have any molecular knowledge. Um, certainly molecular is very hot topic for a lot of our microbiology tests now. However, like the expectation is for us to be at least knowledgeable at that point and simply taking advance was going to put us in a predicament where uh, you're allowed to get one C guys. Uh, and you might want to strategically decide where you want to get your C at. <laughs> um, and if you are a person that happens to have other deficits other than molecular, um, it might not be feasible for you to take more than one C. It's not setting you up for success either, right? I mean, yeah. it just, uh, yeah, so. I appreciate that, so thank you. Uh, UTMB for the, the introduction to molecular diagnostics. <laughs> hey, hey and, and you know, they're they're pioneering a new program, um, you know, and you don't know what you don't know until it it, it, it comes up. So yeah. yeah, good on them for being flexible and, and thinking mm -hmm. on their feet, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so you've taken all your classwork and now it's residency time. Do they just kind of be free after you finish your pathology one or is there somebody there with you how is how does residency work so you for the residency requirements are different for each of the three programs so for utmb you are required to complete four and i call them residencies because uh most of us are not from the galveston area so we have to you know live there <laughs> um, so you are responsible for um you know, obtaining housing, there are dorms available for you to stay at. Um, for me, it was a new college experience because when I originally went to VCU, I was a late admit um, because I was actually supposed to be at Florida A&M, um, but they did not send an acceptance letter that was permissible for my parents to accept. Um, so I ended up at VCU as my backup option. So I actually lived um, solo for most of my years at VCU. So I did not have the experience of being in a dorm with a stranger. Now, uh, as a DCLS, now we're gonna get that experience. So I'm gonna meet my classmates, uh, my cohort in person when I get my white coat at my white coat ceremony, and then we're gonna decide if we're gonna live together, um, right? Just like that. Um, so when you get to your first residency, that is not a, uh, that's not a selection that you get to make. It is a 
same time, same date. Um, so when you go to Grand Rounds, you're going to be in uh, each of the four disciplines with some side rotations into specialty uh, rotations. So you'll be doing things in clinical chemistry like clinical toxicology uh, reports and coagulation slash hematology. You'll mostly be doing uh, diagnostic management team reports for coagulation cases, and these are going to be complex, more leaning towards the more complex thermophilia, lupus anticoagulant, um, genetic type of diseases. Um, in molecular um, slash micro, you'll be doing a mix of plate rounds plus patient reports. And then in transfusion, you'll be doing complex transfusion reports. Now, in each of these, the first thing that the student should recognize is that these are not uh, column type of patient reports, right? You'll have to pull information from each of the other subdisciplines to try to make your report um, what the patient actually needs. And this is without you seeing the patient. So you do have a past resident with you, um, or in the case of clinical chemistry, a uh, a clinical chemistry fellow with you um, that will provide more information that you're going to have to kind of fill in the gap. <clears throat> One of the things that you'll take as a foundational course is introduction to health assessment. Um, and that's going to tell you what the role of like BMI is, what the role of blood pressure is, um, when you should be looking for potential fever um, versus they need to be admitted <laughs> as a fever. Um, so you'll get some baseline things to try to help you form your report. Here, it looks like a lot of writing, but it's not necessarily a lot of writing. Um, you'll have to learn how to use an EHR. Um, so for laboratory personnel that have been just using an LIS, you're gonna get a quick rundown of how to use, uh, for our purposes was EPIC, um, which was a big upgrade from what I had because I had like DOS. <laughs> um, and I felt really comfortable using EPIC um, because at VCU we use Cerner, so I wasn't completely blind to a, a regular uh, system, but um, you'll put all that information together. And then once you finish that, that first rotation, that is where you really need to get signed off because all of that information you learn there, you're going to have to take it into actual rounds with real patients. Uh, meaning like you're going to be in a patient's room reviewing charts pre-rounding um, with a team. So the second rotation for most students will be internal medicine. Internal medicine, I kind of call like the core laboratory. So a bunch of patients, a lot of chaos, <laughs> a lot of lab tests at one time. Like, ah, so my first docket was 18 patients um, to review. Um, as the laboratory expert, I was like, Ooh, that's a lot. They have to come in like, you know, a couple hours or we can't do like an hour. I can't do 18 so minutes. People what was the timeline time. to be able to, to have to review those full, that 18 pa uh, patients? So the recommendation is for you to come in like an hour to two hours early. I'm like, no guys, we, <laughs> I tried that the first time because I didn't know how many people were on the docket um, because I was in the second class, right? There's only like, you know, five other people that we could ask um, in front of me. So I'm like, uh, after the first day, I was like, you know, we're gonna have to come in a lot earlier. Um, in general, the rounding team will actually have the patient split. You as a DCLS student don't get that because it's just you as a DCLS student. So you don't have another laboratory expert with you. That is not to say you can't consult other people, but you don't have a physical person with you. So um, if you're on a large uh, rounding team, then you're going to have to come in a little bit earlier to help review some of the laboratory uh, test utilization. One of the roles that the DCLS student can play is educational. Um, there are a lot of times where we see weird things that are unnecessary uh, that cause you to question patient blood management. Um, so we'll see orders like a CBC and then an H&H. &H. I'm like, that's the, so uh, instead of telling you that you are not correct, I need to understand what you, what your intent is. Are we monitoring for anemia? Are we potentially monitoring post-transfusion? Are we monitoring for leukemia? Um, because we've also seen the other thing where a person has been diagnosed with leukemia and they are in internal medicine um, because the hemoc ward is full. And then I see an order flip to H&H. &H, I'm like, hmm, maybe, maybe we change that back to a CBC uh, with a dip. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you'll be doing as a DCLS student is a lot of education and a lot of test utilization. This is why diagnostic algorithms becomes really important and knowing when a test is appropriate and when it's not appropriate. 
And then sometimes some interpretation issues. Um, so for example, in molecular, when we look at antigen testing, um, and then we keep ordering the same thing without any significant intervention happening, um, there, there are some opportunities for education. Um, me specifically, I did get to do a couple of courses on the coagulation cascade. Um, and uh, at the time, um, before joining Stago, my uh, supervisor, we had Stago equipment at my hospital and the sales rep had actually left a bunch of educational um, slide rollers. And these slide rollers literally tell you if what the anticoagulant effect is on a test. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna bring some of these with me because when I leave the residents and the medical students, they're not going to remember all of the things that I said about ordering appropriately when a patient is on an anticoagulant and the effect. So this is easy for them. They can put it in their lab coat pocket or in their white coat and they can pull it out and say, okay, what did Lashanta say about ordering this test and the patient was on a direct oral anticoagulant? Um, now they can look and see, okay, this is gonna be falsely elevated. Maybe I should consider um, either telling the laboratory that the patient is on a DOAC, um, or I may need to consider potentially uh, discontinuing the direct or anticoagulant um, in favor of testing and then recontinuing post-testing. Um, so you'll get to do a lot of educational um, things. And then you'll also get, it's a two-way street. You'll also learn some educational things. You'll realize where the laboratory fits in in the healthcare system. Instead of you viewing us as the black box where we just throw out numbers, um, you then realize where you fit in into not only the healthcare of the patient, but the education of the medical student, the intern, and the resident. Um, so you'll get to um, go on some adventures with the residents, medical students, and the interns. Um, so I got to go to some of their US MLE classes. This is what they're going to study for their step exam. And I was like, that is a lot, guys. It is a lot of information. This is why it's very difficult for them to understand test utilization because they have so much that they just have to memorize just to get to the next step in their medical career. I'm like, so how do we, this caused me to think as an educator, how do we do a little bit better with trying to educate them about the importance of test utilization for each of the disciplines, right? So simply telling them that you're incorrect for ordering a CBC and H&H &H is not sufficient. You have to tell them what the impact is, like explain to them the um, campaign of patient blood management, right? We're, we're transfusing your patient, but you're over here drawing like multiple times on like Q6 or Q4 every six hours or every four hours as CBC and an H&H, &H, but you're not getting different information. And then what to do with the discrepancies, right? I got an H&H &H that looks like the person's anemic and then the CBC says they're not anemic. So let's talk about preanalytical variables today. <laughs> um, so you get to do a lot of education um, in each of your rotations. So um, I did unfortunately rotate during COVID. So um, I had to do a special rotation. Um, so I was on track to go to antepartum and um, as the story would go, I had some difficulty because I was a bone marrow tech. And um, during the COVID wave, a lot of people thought it's going to be over soon. I was like, not to me, the realist. I was like, this is not going to be over soon. We're going to be in, uh, in a predicament when we have to go do bone marrow bedside assist um, because we were not prepared, right? We, we were, you know, functioning as if COVID didn't exist. Um, where we were, you know, reporting to patients' rooms with our own scrubs on. No problem, right? Not when you are in an isolation room and then you're going to a COVID room. That is a no-no. So then we had to switch from hospital scrubs, uh, switch from our scrubs to hospital scrubs, then to N95 masks, then to full isolation. Then when it came to residency, UTMB had a very strict policy if there was any exposure to COVID and you were a inbound resident, you were to be isolated. And right before I was to go to antepartum residency, I went on a bone marrow bedside assist for a COVID positive patient. And I was removed from residency immediately. Um, even though I was full PPE, you could probably just see my glasses through the shield on top of the other goggles. <laughs> Um, so there's minimal risk of exposure, but I was still removed from residency at that point. So then um, UTMB was quick on their feet. I was remixed into a different antepartum 
group. And then I did a special rotation um, into ANA interpretation and special coagulation interpretation. Um, so that was fun. Um, in that group, I got to teach um, about week D um, and why you should question if your patient went from RH positive to RH negative or vice versa. Um, and why you shouldn't always just blindly uh, trust the result that you get from an outside hospital. Uh, so we went kind of very surface level into reagent uh, sensitivity and specificity for week D. Um, and they were, you know, kind of shocked, like everybody doesn't use the same thing. I was like, guys, um, so healthcare wise, laboratories have budgets. So like here, you have really great reagents at an outside hospital that might be like the only hospital for like a 250 mile radius, they might have to just, you know, do with what budget they have. And they might accidentally create a scenario where you get a different um, RH grouping with your patient um, because that's where your patient could get care at. Um, so it was something that opened their eyes to like, maybe they should have more communication with the laboratory services than what they're doing at the current moment. And then I took a chance. Uh, the program put me in as a first cardiology uh, residency student. <laughs> so I went from anapartum over to uh, cardiology and got to do all of the things I love about all things anticoagulation, <laughs> except got to apply it in a lot of uh, cases of heart failure. Um, and doing a lot of aspirin work um, and a lot of point of care testing. So a lot of different discipline mixes. Um, these residencies are spaced out. So after your first one, which is the one that you can't pick the date, you have to pick when you're going to do residency. And that pick has to coincide somewhat with when you're going to do your doctoral defense project. So you have to time balance. So imagine like you're working full time like I was and you're going to potentially start doing your defense project research, you're going to have to be really, really careful about your timing because, yes, there are students that go through and say, like, I want to do all four residencies at one time. I'm like, that employer must be really nice because giving you four months off at a time is really nice. Um, but the, the balance part is important because you would need to know where you're going to do your research at, whether you're going to do it at your home institution or if you're going to elect to do it at UTMB. Um, and you'll need to select what you're going to do your research on. And if you can actually complete your residency while doing that research, like you can have someone else collect data points for you, or if you need to be the person that collects all of your data points. So it's a lot of things that in the background, while you're doing these residencies, you're also taking doctoral defense project classes to prepare you for your doctoral defense. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, when you're in the second class, it was, it was a little overwhelming. <laughs> oh yeah, most has got our question list. Um, I really wanna make sure we get to ROI is it cool yeah. if we jump to that? Yeah. Go ahead. So, so one of the things I always kind of evaluate um, as a teacher speaking with students, um, there's opportunity costs kind of everywhere as to how, you know, you focus and what you do, you know, post, uh, post undergrad. Um, in terms of the DCLS and your personal experience, what kind of a return on that investment in both time and money, energy, right? Um, do you see in um, hospital work? And then now, again, obviously you're working for Stago, which is awesome, right? That's cool. Um, how has the DCLS made you a more attractive candidate in different roles? And yeah. So uh, small background on the story, right? I started off as a team lead and um, my supervisor very early on selected me to take her place. And much of the leadership knew that. However, um, leadership was split on pathology leadership and clinical laboratory leadership. In the core laboratory, there is a heavy focus on clinical chemistry and not so much on hematology. <laughs> and with some good reason, right? Our, our number of samples is not as plentiful. 
Um, and in the environment I was in, I was doing a lot of things in the hematology lab and outside of the hematology lab. I was on the test utilization committee. I was on the family care medicine line committee. I was also a member of the anticoagulation subcommittee for the hospital. Um, and because of that, my attractiveness started to grow outside of the laboratory very quickly. Um, and that kind of rubbed some of the leadership in the clinical laboratory the wrong way. Um, because there was a, a focus on ensuring the con continuity of the clinical laboratory. And there was a big focus on making me shift to stay inside of the laboratory, which I was very much resistant to. So um, when I thought about what I wanted to do, my goal was very much, I wanted to be the hematology supervisor. That was my goal. Even as a DCLS, I still wanted to be the hematology supervisor because for me, military health was very important. Both of my parents are US Army veterans and I was raised as a military child. Most of my family is actually uh, military connected. And it was an environment that I owed much of my childhood and uh, of course some of my college debt was paid off by uh, the military as well. So I felt like I wanted to stay there. And I kept charging towards that goal. But at some point there was a question of like, well, if it's this hard, maybe we try something else. <laughs> Um, so because I knew that my supervisor was going to select me as her, uh, replacement, I knew that there were going to be some risks with that. And part of that was going to be loss of knowledge on, at the bench level, um, in exchange for going to the supervisory position. So because of that, I started to think about how can I replace my brain on the floor without like you know, doing lots and lots of overtime. <laughs> um, so I was trying to think ahead and I was like, well, automation is kind of a new thing in the hematology space compared to clinical chemistry. And I started to think about where my knowledge would be most lost at. And there are two big sections. One of them was bone marrow. I was like, well, I have to physically replace a person with that. I can't do automation for that. The second place was special coagulation. Um, special coagulation, I could kind of fix that. Um, so I, I started to try to develop a set of rules within the Stago software to replace actions that I would just inherently do on my own with no type of like, <laughs> no type of prompt. I was like, okay, well, I, I've done this a lot of times, at least twice with Sysmex, um, writing rules on the hematology side, because without rules, it's a lot of clicking. So uh, in coagulation, there's less clicking, but still important clicking that has to occur. So I was like, okay, let me reach out to Diagnostic Estago and have them help me um, write rules in their system. Um, and that perked the attention of Diagnostic Estago. Then I made it more complex. I read a paper from ISTH from Dr. DeVries on developing a lupus anticoagulant algorithm that would launch the test based on ratios that were predetermined in the system. So it was going to be not machine learning, right guys? So it's not gonna do something different. It's gonna be based off of a cutoff. So then that perked more people's attention. Um, so then the head of the scientific uh, marketing team at the time, Dr. Paul Riley, came to San Antonio uh, to come speak to me about the development of this algorithm. So this was a key meeting that would occur. Later on, a technical support services position would come open for San Antonio. And I was still matriculating as a DCLS student, so I had no intention of leaving the hospital. Um, at that point, I was like, well, maybe I should, you know, just do an interview. It's been like 10 years. I haven't done an interview. So um, the regional director from Arkansas came to San Antonio and spoke to me in a private uh, conference room. And she said, you know what? I've heard a lot of things about you, but I'm going to be very honest with you. I think that you are better fit for a different position. I was like, okay. So that was the only thing that this lady said to me. 
A little while later, she gave me the name of the position, and it was the Scientific Engagement and Clinical Education Associate for Diagnostic Estago. That position was written for a PhD or an MD, so not a DCLS. However, um, I applied for it, and I was interviewed. This was during my fourth and final residency for cardiology. And uh, I was offered the position. However, my husband did not want to move to New Jersey. He's like, no. I was like, okay, well, I declined the job. <laughs> I was like, okay. So at that point, that this opened the door, right? This cracked the door a little bit. I was like, well, if I can get another job, why haven't I been exploring other options, right? I still really wanted the hematology position. However, the NIH contacted me. Several other people started to reach out to me. NIH reached out to me, Tripler, uh, Army Medical Center out in Hawaii reached out, as well as UTMB themselves, um, asking if I would consider going to a specialty coag supervisor position. I was like, now, like, I'm a pragmatic person, right? I'm buying for this hematology position, which, are, which would require me to do hematology, coagulation, and flow cytometry. And these other folks are just asking me to do one section. So maybe... <laughs> Maybe that would be a better idea. So I approached my husband who also said, no, we're not moving. I was like, okay, so that's not great. Um, so at this time I'm getting ready to graduate and I'm actually the interim supervisor during these interviews. So I'm now in running for the position. Well, uh, during this, I actually have a cap inspection that occurs while I'm the interim and I had been gone to residency and a mistake happens. And it's a big mistake. It's a phase two uh, mistake that uh, actually impacted several hundred patient data points for PT INR. And um, I was very upset um, about it. And this is when the crack became very big. Because when I approached leadership, I was like, hey, guys, this is a big deal because INRs for Coumadin patients are used to dose their Coumadin. And since this is several hundred points, um, I can't necessarily look at all of the patient records to determine if there has been patient harm, like there has been either underdosing or overdosing of a, uh, a, a causing an adverse drug effect. Uh, so clinical laboratory leadership looked at me like bewildered, like they had never heard of an ADE. I'm like, that is a, like... I know, I know we don't deal with the FDA in the core lab, but an ADE would be an FDA-ish <laughs> issue. Um, so this caused me to really ponder, I'm like, is this how things are going to be where I'm not going to have leadership that is knowledgeable about clinical impact to a patient? And if so, can me as a solo person fill that educational gap or is this something that is considered to be a sinking ship? So my question would be answered in the summer where we would do a Cerner conversion to a change to our LAS and EHR. I was like, oh, okay, that's good. We're getting a new system. We're not using DOS anymore. But then I found out I was gonna be the only pilot for hematology, flow cytometry, uh, apheresis, anatomic pathology for hematology and flow cytometry. I was like, so then I went back to my leadership. I said, hey guys, have you been on an airplane recently? Like, yeah, I was like, have you ever looked in the cockpit? They're like, yeah. I was like, how many people do you see up there? They're like, there's two. I was like, you know why there's two? If you saw one, I would get off the plane like immediately. <laughs> because if you only have one person, you are taking a big risk because you are now assuming that nothing will happen to me, right? That, are you going to say, you're saying you're going to quit? I was like, I mean, that's a potential. I mean, that is a, a real thing that can happen or any other variable things that happen to me, right? Um, I could have, you know, I can get pregnant. I could have something happen to a family member. Like anything could happen to me where I'm not available. And this is not a good idea. They're like, oh yeah, speaking of not good ideas, we're also going to give you a Sysmex project conversion as well. I was like, all right. So, and, and mind you, this is now a third interim that's in the, in place. This so is now as a supervisor. Is that, is that, that accurate? Mm -hmm. This is as a supervisor position, right? Is it? No, I, I've now gone back to being the lead. There's another interim that is now in place. 
during this. So there is no actual supervisor in the section. There's just interims that have gone in. So now I'm like, oh, this is not going to be great because we don't have an acting supervisor. Um, we have an interim. And now we're doing a, a EHR conversion plus a SysMex conversion project um, in the middle of the EHR conversion project. And um, it's questionable if I'm going to get the supervisor position, right? So we selected a third interim. So um, in the middle of this, the clinical chemistry supervisor leaves. She vacates. Um, so I was like, okay, this is not looking great, guys. So we're getting a little, <laughs> we're a little worried here. Um, so at this time in September of 2021, so I've missed graduation outright. So I had to deal with the cap inspection. So I missed my graduation defense date. My chair actually reached, reached out to me in September of 2021. And she has a very harsh conversation with me. Uh, more if she calls it a reality checks <laughs> conversation. I call it a harsh conversation. Um, where she says that um, she has gotten fed up with me um, not making it to graduation. At this point, I have mentored a student that's an active duty soldier who came in about two years after me and he's now in the graduating class and I'm not. <laughs> um, so at this point, my ROI looks questionable because now I'm going to be in a semester without actually matriculation. So I'm just in hold. So I have to pay to stay in the university to graduate, but I'm not actually doing any classes at this point. So ROI looks questionable for me. I'm like, well, I really want to graduate, but I keep getting boulders kind of placed in front of me. Um, so she has a harsh conversation with me. Um, and she says, uh, if you do not make it to defense as of December, 2021, I will withdraw as your chair and you will partially start over. I was like, ooh, no, that's not, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> um, so now I have to have a conversation with leadership. Um, and this time I approached pathology leadership and I uh, tell them, I was like, I really wanna graduate. Like, I understand I'm needed here in the hospital, but this is a goal of mine. I, I want to graduate. I put in the work. My chair is threatening to withdraw if I do not progress this semester. So in, towards the end of September, 2021, the group of uh, core lab staff and I decided to go to what was then called AACC. Um, and right before that, I got a phone call from Diagnostic Estago. They called back and said, hey, are you still interested in that scientific engagement and clinical education associate position? I was like, yes, because I have no progression towards supervisor right now. So <laughs> yes, so they uh, fly me to Newark and I come to the US office and interview um, with the marketing and scientific affairs team. And um, I also interview with uh, the CEO of the company and uh, they offer me, re-offer the job to me as a hybrid position. So now I'm like, all right, husband, so hybrid. So I'm gonna still stay here in San Antonio. I just have to go other places occasionally. Um, so he's like, I think, I think this is a good fit for you. So then I take the, the contract and then I look at it and I start crying. Because I'm like, okay, this is now the first time in like 15 years I have to make a decision on employment and I don't know what to do. Like, I don't want to leave my staff members. I also want to graduate. <laughs> so I take it to my three team paths who are my mentors and they look at the contract, look at me, look at the contract. They're like, we think you should sign this immediately. I was like, you don't want me to be the supervisor? I was like, if we were being going to be selfish, we, we would keep you forever. However, we know that what you do in the hospital, you can do so much more. You can educate so many other people with what you know inside of your head. And we can't guarantee you that we can shield you forever because, right, we tried to help you to get to graduation. You saw what happened. Like, yes, I did. <laughs> so uh, there's a caveat on my contract that says I have to graduate uh, as of December 2021. I was like, ooh, well, it's time to start buckling down, guys. Um, so I put my head down. I'm like, I'm just going to grind out, guys. Uh, I'll do what I can for the EHR conversion project, but I have to get to graduation. So I go to the AACC conference, and about a week later, I get promoted to the supervisor. 
So now we have an ethics question. So all the students that are listening and all the other laboratory professionals, what would you do, right? You have a job offer in your hand, but it has a conditional on it. You have to graduate. You've been promoted to supervisor, albeit after the vacation of the chemistry supervisor, questionably. <laughs> so what do you do now? Do you A, keep the supervisor position and hope that you graduate? B, sign the contract and keep the supervisor position? Well, guess what guys, we signed with B. <laughs> so I kept my supervisor position um, because there was no guarantee that I was gonna graduate guys. So ethically speaking, I felt very terrible about this because there was a good chance that I was gonna leave, but there was also a chance that I was not gonna graduate. This was based on the fact that I didn't graduate the last semester. Um, ROI was, I needed to graduate because I don't wanna keep paying to sit in class and not actually uh, get to graduation. So on December, uh, the first week of December, I selected my defense date and my chair signed off on it. And uh, Diagnostic Estago's scientific affairs head um, and one of the technical support educational specialists also attended my defense uh, for disseminated intravascular coagulation. And uh, then I was announced as Dr. Bryce. And then I had a terrible decision to make, guys. So now I have a supervisor position and an actual job um, outside the Department of Defense. So um, as you guys know, I work for Stago, so you know what I decided. However, I negotiated with Stago because we were Stago customers. And I was not in a Stago employee yet. Um, and they had a large EHR project where I was the solo pilot. Um, for multiple sections. So I negotiated with Stago to ask them, could I stay until the EHR conversion project was completed? Um, and Stago graciously said yes. Um, probably a wise business decision as it was their largest DOD account. <laughs> it could very well be used in a negative light later on. Um, so I stayed during the EHR conversion project. And then after that conversion project was completed, I started my adventure as a scientific engagement and clinical education associate at first, um, where I started using all of my uh, skills as an educator within the laboratory and then outside of the laboratory by teaching medical students, interns and residents about coagulation. And now I get paid to do that for multiple hospitals across the United States and Canada with some highlights overseas as well. So. So, so far I've done the National Blood Clotting Alliance where I did a patient educational series on antiphospholipid syndrome. I've also done several interviews um, with ADLM, which was formerly AACC, about the role of the DCLS in industry on their clinical, not clinical, corporate advisory board, um, about where the DCLS can go um, outside the hospital, right? Because a lot of times we think the DCLS should be inside the hospital, but what happens if you take all of that knowledge that you learn from residency, all of your MLS skills, and all of your skills that you learn just teaching medical laboratory professionals, and then you applied it across the entire United, United States and Canada with the ability to actually do webinars on things like, what do I do when my quality control doesn't work in coagulation? It's not Russian roulette, guys. That's the wrong answer. So <laughs> That's fascinating. So this position was contingent upon your DCLS. So Graduate. long, yeah, long story short, right? Like um, it was all or nothing there. Um, I just wanted to try to support you a little bit. I think you made the best decision for you. And I would generally encourage friends, uh, people watching, they should always make the best decision for for themselves and their family. Yes. And um, I, you seem like a kind-hearted, thoughtful person. I appreciate very much that you cared about what happened in the lab that you you know you grew up in, you know, and and um, but you got to do what's best for number one. Um, so. You made the right decision. <laughs> and interestingly um, enough, um, actually, guys, when I first declined that position, uh, Dr. Riley actually got in contact with the program director for the DCLS program and sent that job description out to my cohort, my classmates. 
because they really wanted, once they learned about what the DCLS was, they really wanted a DCLS for that position. Um, so, so, what the, so that's uh, great to, to hear, actually, because yes. that's what I wanted to see, because this seems like such a... Um, it's somewhat novel, right? I guess it's like sort. It's um, so because I, I wanted to look at the role of a DCLS as it could be in a hospital. How do hospitals kind of view DCLS? And then what is industry care? And it's fascinating for you to kind of segue into that naturally. That industry really does care about this. Yes, because one of the things that happened um, was my first year was learning, right? And now I'm, not, I'm outside the hospital, right? So now I got to decompress, right? Because I've been in a core laboratory where everything's like, sat, 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 sat. And now they're like, okay, now you have to learn how to project manage with actual time to do the project. <laughs> not you have a compressed like one week to do a lot of things <laughs> at one time. <laughs> so uh, my first year, I learned a lot of things. And a lot of industry partners have what are called clinical advisory boards. And those boards are made up of clinicians, primarily for IVD um, partners. They are made up of pathologists. And I got to sit in for two of those boards as a fly on the wall. And one of the things I learned was, was the clinical advisory board the only option that an IVD company should use to develop their products, right? So the clinical advisory board gives information about what is going on in the clinical space with your assays, right? So when we think about coagulation, where we saw the what we call the death of Coumadin um, in favor of direct oral anticoagulants. And we, when I talk to students about this, I say, you know, remember when we first saw commercials on Xarelto, it would always say like, no laboratory testing necessary. And now you don't see that uh, highlighted in the commercial anymore because we found out there are some scenarios where we might actually need to be cognizant of what uh, the drug level is for the direct oral anticoagulant. Um, so your clinical advisory board, they're really good at being investigators or detectives for that because they can talk to their clinical partners about where the anticoagulation scene is going, right? Mm -hmm. So we look at, you know, what is the next thing that's going to come up? But then when we look at what the IVD company offers, if you are a company that does reagents, consumables and instrumentation, pathologists aren't the users of those things. <clears throat> so um, when I would ask questions that were, albeit what they would call technical questions, which we would not consider to be technical questions, I would get varied answers. And sometimes they're kind of like off the wall answers. Like when I asked how long a stat would take, they would say like four to six hours. I'm like the core laboratory did four to six hours. People would like pick it the entire core lab. <laughs> like, <laughs> but the reason why I asked that question was to try to gauge where their knowledge was about what goes on in their clinical laboratories. What I found out was, is that they are kind of disconnected from the process. So after year one, the, the uh, young man that interviewed me, which was the CEO of the company, uh, I went to him and I said, I would like to do a proposal. And my supervisor at that time was like, it's been a year and you're already shooting at the CEO for a proposal. I was like, well, yes, I think it's important, right? Because I've been a long time Sago user. Um, however, I think that we need what we would call a voice of customer or as I've aptly named it, a voice of a laboratorian. So we have a clinical advisory board where we fly these individuals into the headquarters office. We uh, have a whole meeting with them and we talk about all things in the clinical space. What if we did that for a group of laboratorians? And before I say this whole proposal, I want to do, I do want to tell you that I have a plan in mind where I don't want um, what we will call creme de la creme, right? I don't want a bunch of laboratorians from very large medical institutions. I want a diverse group. I want a DCLS. I want a PhD clinical chemist that's friendly towards coagulation. Um, I want someone that is at a rural hospital, someone that has VA or DOD experience. I want a plethora of experience and they don't, they don't have to be stalwart users. I, in fact, I don't want them to all be stalwart users. 
the whole goal of this is to try to interpret where the hemostasis laboratory is going in current time and then where is it going in future state mm -hmm. and what we can do as a company to ensure that we get there with the group instead of you know kind of lagging behind the times yeah. um and the ceo is like okay if you can find your group and submit a budget to me i'll approve it i was like i've got it um so i reached back out to the dcls pool i was like hey friends <laughs> but, <laughs> um i am recruiting for a laboratory advisory board um and the first question was like well we're not stopping you usually like, i i am aware i can see in our, our corporate business suite that you're not a stock user however you have lots and lots of coagulation experience yeah. Yeah. so with that, that created some connections um, that would not be usually something that a laboratory would do, right? We're all introverts. We're like, eh, we don't want to stay connected everywhere. But um, one of the first things I did was I reached out to two of my uh, DCLS classmates that were in the first class um, and had them do not actually laboratory advisory things. They actually served as webinar speakers for Stago. Um, and Santosh actually did a full webinar on the value of keeping specialty coagulation in-house. And it was a big hit with the clinical laboratory and clinical partners to understand the ins and outs of what happens when you send out specialty coagulation testing and the impact it has on patient care pathways. Um, so from there, um, I launched into being more active with AACC and found PhD clinical chemistry folks that were coagulation friendly. And in fact, two of those individuals actually did webinars for us this last lab week um, to talk about direct oral anticoagulants and why you should or should not bring them in-house for testing. And then um, one also talked about what the physician should know about coagulation testing and how you as a laboratorian can actually fill in the gap for them. So um, these folks have uh, done wonders for the educational space for hemostasis and will continue to do wonders for IVD companies by serving as pioneers in getting the laboratory's voice heard for assay development, for instrumentation development. From there, then I asked about well, what happens if we, you know, kind of impact FDA studies? And they're like, wait, 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 that's too far. I was like, no, no, nope. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be the, the uh, PI for an FDA study. What I am saying is that maybe we take this same concept and we do what is kind of called a pre-market for an FDA assay, but a pre-market for you as the developer of the assay. Get the opinion of a real life laboratory on an assay and then you can kind of design your study based off of the feedback of those of those individuals right let's say you're doing an assay in research and development and it works perfect sensitivity is great specificity is great and then we launch it and the clinical laboratory is like we hate this there's a lot of issues with this it sucks on proficiency testing like well, how about we do those steps before we design a whole FDA study that is going to do very well because you're in a space where nothing happens. And like, I'm telling you guys right now, as a long time uh, person in the core laboratory, that is not what happens. Like I can walk in the at 7 a.m. and like nine things will happen to me before I cross the threshold. <laughs> so imagine you want your assay to work, but those nine things then still occur to the individual that has to do the assay. I think these are things we have to take in consideration. And uh, the marketing team kind of looked like that's a really good way to think about things because sometimes we give the, the laboratory something that they didn't ask for. I was like, because we don't ask. <laughs> yep. A solution looking for a problem, right? And then, yes. yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very insightful. And I think laboratorians generally, our opinions get overlooked because of that introvert, like you, you know, you brought up. Um, so bringing us in, yes. you know, pulling us into the equation is integral. Um, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that application. And th these are not things I would have thought about, like how to remain solely in the laboratory, not on the, the grand scale that it is now. Um, and this also led to me talking about 
the difference between the PhD versus the DCLS, right? So Stago is very fortunate where they have Dr. Riley as a PhD and me as a DCLS. And we act as a seesaw, right? Dr. Riley will oftentimes give us this like really great idea in my whole job. And he will like shake his head and say, that is a terrible way to present that. I was like, my whole job is to give you a reality check. Does that theory work in reality? It's like from, from a practical standpoint, he's like, can you rephrase? I was like, think of it as you are a researcher, right? Your degree is based in basic research, basic science research. The MLS, even the MLS, not necessarily just the DCLS, the MLS is your translational scientist. We make what you want as your idea into practice. And the DCLS makes it so that we can tell you in practice, does this work on both sides? Does this work for the clinical laboratory? And then does this actually meet the need of the clinician? Like a lot of times we think about an assay and then we kind of stop, right? Where we think about anti-10A, we know it's far better at monitoring heparin, but then you're thinking of it in the closed space of the clinical laboratory. You have to be able to educate pharmacy, the clinicians, about developing a nomogram to actually make it into practice. It does no good to implement a test in the clinical laboratory, but the actual people that are the interested parties don't know anything about it. Yeah. So our goal yeah. is not to educate just the clinical laboratory, is to educate the clinical laboratory to be educators about their assay and champions on what is best practice so that they can ensure good patient care. That was an incredibly insightful way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. That's cool. This has been fantastic. I think we learned a lot about not only the differences between, you know, the bachelor's, the master's, and the, the doctorate level, but I think we learned a lot about what you can do with a DCLS because this is kind of stuff that, I mean, Dave and I haven't thought of that, and I'm sure a lot of other people haven't thought of it either. So, Lashanta, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on our show and share your experience with all of us. I greatly appreciate the invite. I, like I said, I am a lover of all things hematology. I'm friendly towards the other disciplines, but my great love is for hematology. You're in great company here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you.